as a reminder, passive transport is the movement of a molecule or substance without the use of energy. And that's going to be the focus of this video. We'll talk about active transport in the next one. So passive transport is the movement and diffusion of a substance across a membrane with no energy invested. This means that the molecules are moving on their own, but something has to drive that movement. Movement of these molecules happens by a process called a called diffusion, and then water moves by a special uh, type of diffusion called osmosis. In diffusion, a substance or particles moves out of an area of high concentration toward an area of low concentration and into available space. Diffusion can happen either across a membrane or through a solution. So one of the differences here between osmosis and diffusion is that um, diffusion can happen um, in the solution. So if you have a, um, <clears throat> say, a drop of some sort of dye uh, in a beaker of water and it's on, you put it on top, eventually it's going to flow and spread out. This is diffusion. Um, you can also have that movement across a membrane, which is what we are talking about uh, here in this chapter. Movement by diffusion depends entirely on concentration gradients. When we talk about these, you need to pay attention to which concentration we're talking about. Um, so as we go through, um, sometimes we're talking about the concentration of a solute, sometimes we're talking about the concentration of water or the solution, so just be mindful of what is moving. So without any other forces acting upon it, a substance is going to move down its concentration gradient. This means that if you have something concentrated in a particular area, it's going to move from that area of high concentration out into an area of low concentration. It's important to keep in mind that if you have one substance moving, um, it moves based on its own concentration. The concentration of the other substance doesn't really affect it. So here we have a diagram showing uh, water molecules of, I'm sorry, dye molecules uh, in a solution of water that's being separated by a membrane um, through which those molecules of dye can move. So the water can move freely through those because it's, uh, the molecules are small. The dye is slightly larger, um, and as the dye moves, it can do one of two things. It can bump into that membrane or it can move across that membrane. So here we have sort of a selectively permeable membrane. It allows the movement of water freely um, and sort of slows down the dye. On the left, we have a high concentration of those yellow dye molecules, <clears throat> and those molecules are going to move around within that solution. They have their own energy, and they're going to move around, and they're going to bump into each other. They're going to bump into the sides of the flask. They're going to bump into that membrane in the middle. But some of them are going to move across that membrane. And they move across that membrane because of that high concentration gradient. All of those molecules bumping into each other causes them to move away. Diffusion happens until the concentration becomes equal on each side. Just like a chemical equilibrium, in this situation we have an equilibrium where molecules continue to move, but the net movement, the net gain or loss on either side of that membrane is going to be the same. So the molecules continue to move back and forth, but there's no change in concentration because now they're equal concentration on both sides. Remember that each molecule moves independently along its own concentration gradient. So here we've added a purple molecule. That yellow molecule is going to move the same way. It's going to move from uh, the left side there, the high concentration, down to the right side over there, where the yellow is in low concentration, again, until it reaches chemical equilibrium. The purple dye is going to move independently. 
The purple dye is going to move from where it was more highly concentrated on the right across that membrane to the left again until it reaches its own chemical equilibrium. Osmosis is a special type of diffusion. Osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules and in this case it has to be across a membrane. This is really important for organisms that live in uh, an aquatic environment. It's also really important for any of the cells in your body that are bathed in fluid, which is most of them. Uh, most of our body is made up of water and so most of our cells are surrounded by water and fluids of some sort. So the way that water moves into and out of the cell is really important for the health and the survival of that cell. In osmosis, the molecule that's diffusing is water. Water behaves the same way. Water molecules, think of um, molecules of water, not sort of a puddle of water, but the individual water molecules are going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And this is where we really need to pay attention to what we're talking about because the concentration of water depends on the concentration of solutes that are dissolved within it. Um, <clears throat> so we have an area where water is in high concentration, which means the solutes in that water are in low concentration. That water is going to move from where there's a lot of water molecules concentrated to an area of where there's less water molecules concentrated. Alternately, that means there's a high solute concentration. But we're talking about water moving across a membrane. And so in this case, we're talking about water movement, not solute movement. So across a membrane that allows water to move, but not the solute. So here we have a U-shaped tube. And on one side, on the left-hand side, we see that we have these green sugar molecules and we have a semi-permeable membrane in the middle. On the left, let's see, on the left-hand side of the left-hand U tube, we have a lower concentration of solute which means we have a higher concentration of water, sorry, of water. So over on this side, low solute, high water concentration. Water wants to leave this area of high concentration of water and move across that membrane. So when this happens, the sugar molecules can't move, but the water does. And so on the right-hand side here, we have our equilibrium. We have an area where the water concentrations are now equal. So water molecules can move back and forth, but there's gonna be no net movement because we have reached equilibrium. So remember, this is diffusion, but it is diffusion of water. We can see what's happening down there on the bottom. The bottom image shows uh, sort of the water molecules specifically, and then the sugar molecules are still in green. But we've zoomed in a little bit, and now we can actually see those water molecules. And we can see what we mean by free water. So on the left-hand side, we, you can see that there's a lot of water molecules here compared to the number of sugar molecules. All of these water molecules are free water molecules. We have some that are attached to the sugar molecule. On the other side, because we have this high concentration of solute, more of those water molecules are attached to, attracted to that sugar, and therefore uh, they are not free in solution. So water molecules are in a lower concentration. This is what drives the movement of those water molecules from left to right, down its concentration gradient. I'd like you to look at this image and think about what is moving. So we have uh, those blue molecules, those are supposed to represent water, and then we have a semi-permeable membrane in the middle, and then we have those black dots um, that are just any solute. So pause the video and take a minute to think about what is going to move and how. In this case, 
water molecules are going to move from this area of high concentration to this area of low concentration, which means we have diffusion, I'm sorry, we have osmosis, <laughs> the diffusion of water. Um, if those solutes could also move, then we would have diffusion of those solutes. Water balance is really important in living organisms, either living organisms that are uh, in an aquatic environment of some sort or in cells that are surrounded by fluid, surrounded by water. So this leads us to the concept of tonicity. Tonicity often confuses students because we're looking at two different things happening at the same time. In tonicity, we have to look at the concentration of solutes in the surrounding solution and their ability to cause osmosis or water movement. So um, a minute ago we said we were worried about the concentration of the free water molecules and we're still worried about those. But now we have to look at where the solute concentration is highest. Um, so tonicity is the ability of um, the surrounding solution to cause water to move in or out of the cell. Um, there are a lot of examples of why this is important. We'll talk about a couple of them. But let's start out by talking about um, when you have equal concentrations of solutes. In this situation, the concentrations are called isotonic. Iso meaning same. So this means that the solute concentrations outside the cell are same as the concentration inside the cell. Now this also implies that the water concentrations are the same on the inside and out. So what's going to happen? What moves and how does it move? In an isotonic situation, water is still moving in and out of the, the cell, um, but it remember, this is an equilibrium situation. So water can move in and out of the cell. It's just moving in and out at the same rate. Um, and depending on the type of cell, you may or may not want an isotonic situation. Um, our blood cells are a really good example. Uh, blood cells have uh, solutes inside, there are solutes in the fluid surrounding. Um, and so blood cells um, can be affected by the solute concentration in, in the blood. Um, so blood cells actually want to be isotonic. Um, you want to keep them nice and plump and filled up with water that they need. Plant cells, on the other hand, actually don't benefit as much from an isotonic situation. In that plant cell on the bottom, we see that large central vacuole where it is storing water. Um, and we see water moving in and out of the plant cell. The problem here is that vacuole is not filled all the way. And so that cell is actually flaccid or a little bit limp. Um, and that's not the most healthy state for that cell. Our next situation is a hypertonic situation. In a hypertonic situation, the solute concentration is higher outside the cell than inside. This means water is lower outside and higher inside. Remember, water wants to move from high to low concentration. So this means that in a hypertonic situation, water is going to leave the cell because the concentration of water is higher inside the cell and the concentration of solute is higher outside. That means the water moves from the high inside concentration to the low water concentration outside. This produces a shriveled or a shrunken cell. And in general, this is not a good situation for a cell. If it's our blood cell up there, uh, the cell is going to shrivel or shrink. Um, this can happen um, if you are given a, an IV saline solution that's the wrong concentration. You have too much salt in the fluids in your blood and this can cause your cell to shrivel. 
Um, in plants, this is also a big deal. Um, water diffuses out because it's a higher concentration inside the cell. And that causes that central vacuole to shrink. Um, this causes something called plasmolysis, or plasm, uh, we say that the cell is plasmalized, um, because the plasma membrane actually pulls away from that cell wall. This can lead to the plant dying. Our last situation is a hypotonic situation. In a hypotonic situation, the solute concentration is lower outside, which makes the water concentration higher outside the cell. And so water is going to rush into the cell because it's going to move from an area of high concentration outside to the area of low concentration inside. In this case, we get our cells bursting, um, our blood cells bursting. In a plant cell, this is actually the best situation. Um, in the plant cell, we have uh, that water rushing in, filling up that central vacuole, and it causes the cell to swell up. But unlike our blood cells, uh, the cell wall of the plant cell actually acts as sort of a buffer. And so as that central vacuole fills up, uh, the contents of the cell push outward on that cell wall. The cell wall, uh, actually sort of fights back and what we call turgor pressure builds up and the cell becomes turgid. This means firm or stiff. So that central vacuole actually fills up the cell, causes the cell to be nice and stiff and the cell wall pushes back. And so you get a nice balance between a healthy volume of water in the cell and also it limits the, the amount of water that can come in even due to changes in concentration. Cell walls help regulate the cellular, cellular structure and the ability of cells to withstand changes in uh, water concentrations um, due to tonicity. Um, and again, I said this was called turgor pressure. Um, this cell is just sort of a um, summary of some of the terms that I used. Um, but living, I'm sorry, not living organisms. Um, other cells, eukaryotic cells, without a cell wall can actually have a lot of problems because if you are a um, organism that lives in an aquatic environment and uh, the water around you, the concentration of solutes change, um, that can cause an influx or an efflux of water. And so although plants have this uh, nice adaptation to help moderate the movement of water, um, animal cells and eukaryotic cells don't always have these. Instead, they have the ability to perform something called osmoregulation. In osmoregulation, uh, there is generally some sort of pump mechanism that can pump water out of the cell. Um, so this is a, a paramecium. It's an organism that lives in an aquatic environment. And its adaptation to changes in tonicity is the use of something called the contractile vacuole. So just like the central vacuole in plants, the contractile vacuole can hold water. Um, and so if water rushes into the cell, it can be moved into the contractile vacuole. The cool thing here is that it doesn't continue to expand and burst like we saw in our water cell, I'm sorry, our blood cell, um, but that contractile vacuole can actually pump water back out. So I like to think of it as sort of a bilge pump on a boat. Um, water comes in and then that contractile vacuole can pump it back out to maintain the proper water balance within the cell.